As we continue our thoughts about Jesus as he approaches this last week of his life, today we look at Wednesday and his encounter with this woman and Bethany and also bringing to head who's for him and who's against him. Now, for those of you that may have missed a few Sundays, we're, we're looking at the last week of Jesus during the season of Lent, and we're using Mark as our foundation. Mark was the first gospel written before the other gospels. And in this story, we see Jesus, who has already been to Jerusalem three times, and he's living, staying in Bethany during the week, and while he's there, the Passover is taking place. We have this idea that when Jesus made his entry on Palm Sunday, that the crowds, of course, rejoiced and thought he was great and wonderful, and then they just simply abandoned him. They left him. But that wasn't true. For Passover was a very politically tense time. All of the Jewish people gathered from the countryside to come and to observe Passover. Now, if you're a Bible student, you know what that means. That means to celebrate the Passover that took place in Egypt where God delivered the children of Israel from their bondage and brought them out of the land through Moses' leadership. And they passed over because blood was sprinkled on the door lintel and the angel of death passed over those homes of the Jewish people and allowed them to remain whole as they started their exodus. They were being freed from bondage in Egypt. In Jerusalem, they have Roman guards on every street corner. They are under bondage again. And now all of the Jewish people are celebrating their deliverance, and they're not delivered. So it was a politically tense time, and Pilate was no fool. He was a politician, and he knew that he'd better show up, and he'd better make a presence. And so Jesus comes to Jerusalem. Now, in the church, we have this idea that this was all foreordained and that Jesus had no choice. He simply was playing the parts that God had given to him, and he simply walked through it. But I don't believe that. I believe that one of the greatest gifts that God gives to each and every one of us is free will. It's that ability to choose. And if you look at the story of Adam and Eve in the garden, what was the thing that brought them down? It was their choices that brought them down. Our ability to choose, our free will. And so we serve a God who gives us the ability to choose whether we're going to serve him or whether we're not. And certainly Jesus had the choices before him. He could have stayed away from Jerusalem. He could have said, I'm not going there. I don't want to pay that price. But Jesus went because, not because he was preordained or predetermined to go. He went because he had a message to proclaim. And that message was simply this. You're either going to follow the empire of power or you're going to be a part of the kingdom of God. And he was making that proclamation that Passover season. And the crowds were rejoicing. In fact, in verse 2, the religious leaders, and again, these are not evil people. These are people who are simply trying to protect the system, the status quo. We've got it all worked out. Let's not cause any waves. You've heard that argument before. Let's not change anything. The religious leaders were simply trying to keep everything calm and settled. But they realized that if they didn't address this problem of Jesus, the Romans would. And if the Romans addressed the problem of Jesus, then they themselves might no longer by, might be in power. They might be in prison, or they might be dead. And so they realized they had to do something. They decided that they were going to arrest Jesus. But as they looked around that city that week, they realized that it wasn't going to happen. Jesus was too popular. The people were responding to his message. They were listening to his words. They were longing for freedom. They were longing to leave the oppression that they were under. 
and the crowds and the multitudes followed Jesus. And in verse 2 it says, they gave up. They knew they couldn't do it. Jesus had won the battle. He had won. The authorities were not going to arrest him because he was too popular. And suddenly Mark does again what he did last time. He puts in what seemingly is an unrelated story before he comes back to the original story. And this unrelated story takes place in Bethany where Jesus is sitting at the home of Simon the leper and he's having a meal. And in comes a woman who takes a very expensive bottle of ointment, breaks it open, and pours it upon the head of Jesus to anoint him. Well, suddenly, the disciples were there were indignant. Have you ever seen anyone indignant? <laughs> Their nose was up in the air. What a waste. It's terrible. What is this woman doing? Why is she here? Why would, who invited her? We could have done so many wonderful ministries with this. Well, it reminds you of church council. <laughs> but Jesus says, leave her alone. Leave her alone because she, now get this, she, this woman, this non-disciple, this unidentified woman, this person who was considered less than worthy because of the patriarchal system of that day and age, this woman comes in and anoints the head of Jesus, and he says she has done the right thing. Because more than the disciples, more than the followers of Jesus, this woman realized what was going to happen as Jesus followed the course of his life. She realized that he was going to pay the ultimate price, and so she came before to anoint his body because she realized she could not do it after the fact. And so she came, and what did she do? She gave the most expensive gift she could give. What would cost her, you know, for a whole year's wages, she gave it and poured it on the head of Jesus. And there is so much going on in this passage of Scripture. Why would she do that? Well, because she'd been forgiven. And she knew that Jesus loved her and accepted her as she was. That she didn't have to play the religious game. And she could come because she was forgiven and she could give freely. And notice she didn't come with a want list like I might do. Oh Lord, I need this. Could you help me here? Could you do this for me? She didn't do that. She came and she gave freely all that she had. The disciples were complaining about what they could do for the poor, how that money might have been spent. And Jesus, again, he says, you're always going to have the poor. And we will always have the poor in our world. We will never solve poverty. It is always going to be here. And Jesus says, you can do for the poor anytime you want to. But this woman, this woman has done it for me. Her gift was an act of worship for me. And suddenly I realized as I studied that passage of Scripture how many times in the church we do our ministry for the poor, for the homeless, for the needy, and that's wonderful and great. But when was the last time we brought a gift to God for worship? And what would such a gift be? Would it be a tip? Would it even perhaps even be our tithe? Or could it be as this woman demonstrated everything that she had? She came to God and gave it all. And Jesus said, because of what you have done, you're the one, you are the first Christian, you are the one out of all of my followers and out of all of the disciples, you are the one that fully understands what is taking place. And because of that, wherever this story is told, you'll be remembered. Jesus has had a good day. The disciples 
had been following him. The Roman authorities had given up. They weren't going to try to do anything. He was too popular. The woman recognized who he was and anointed him, proclaiming him, worshiping him, by giving her all to him. And now we come to Judas. And if you look in your passage of Scripture, you will notice that Mark always says, Judas, one of the twelve. Now we in tradition, we like to separate ourselves from Judas. We say he's way over there. He's doing what, what he's doing on his own. We're not a part of it. But as far as Mark was concerned, that first gospel writer, all the disciples were a part of it. For they didn't understand what was going on. They had followed Jesus for three years. They had heard his teachings. They had seen his miracles, but they still didn't get it. Judas goes to the scribes and Pharisees and says, I'll make you a deal. I'll give Jesus to you. I wonder what the scribes and Pharisees thought when they heard those words. How astonished they must have been to realize that one of his own, one of his followers, one of his disciples was going to betray him. Where are we in the story? That's up to us. It's our choice. We're not predetermined to do anything. We can choose to worship God because we've been forgiven and we've received that forgiveness in our hearts and our lives. We can choose to give the best that we have to God and the kingdom or we can choose to betray Jesus. Betray him because we don't pay attention, because we put him in a box on Sunday morning, because we really don't let him change our lives. Jesus wants to change us. And so that Wednesday evening, Judas Iscariot set in motion the drama that was going to take place for the next three days. As we come to take Holy Communion this morning, we come not out of habit, not out of law. We come by invitation. The table is for everyone. You do not have to be a Methodist or a member of this church. All you have to be is in love with God and at peace with your neighbor. And if you are, you're invited to come and to partake of this holy meal. And so as we prepare our hearts to receive this meal, what choices are you making today for God?